Uh, I'm Kip Atley from All Saints and wish you all a Merry Christmas and glad you're here. And today we're going to talk about ships in a bottle. I, uh, the only reason we're talking about ships in a bottle is at one point my friend Cheryl Munn said, Kip, you got to ante up and do another skills show. <laughs> and Cheryl, the only thing I've ever done people might be interested in was putting a ship in a bottle. He said, well, that sounds interesting. I said, well, you know, come to think of it, it's been at least 40 years since I've done that. And uh, over the week, I've discovered how little I remembered of putting ships in a bottle. But that's okay, because it's always kind of a unique process. Because uh, everything, literally everything ends up being different. So why ships in a bottle? Uh, sailors have been doing it for hundreds of years. Uh, as you all know, it used to be that sailing ships going around the world would count be on cruises often one to three years long if they got back at all. Uh, they had a lot of time when they weren't on their watch for the, the ship and they did a lot of things to keep themselves busy and to earn a little income when they got back to port. Uh, you're familiar with Scrimshaw. Uh, sailors also did a lot of knitting, a lot of crocheting, and uh, sometimes ships in a bottle. And all of those were pretty functional or income producing for them. The uh, first recorded piece of history that I'm aware of, of anything being put in a bottle other than whiskey, uh, was about 1719, and it wasn't a ship. The first recorded uh, ship in a bottle that I'm aware of was in the 1780s, mid-1780s, uh, and it was a Portuguese or Turkish man of war that someone put in a bottle. When clipper ships became uh, much in use, I started to say popular, but that's really the point, crossing the Atlantic uh, in just a few days compared to months, uh, they caught the imagination of the general public and ships in a bottle became really uh, of interest to people at that time. As a result, most of the antique ships in a bottle that exist currently are from the 1840s and later because of the, the clipper craze, if you will. Uh, John and I, and, and perhaps others of you, enjoy sailing. And, and one of the things about sailing ships or boats is they're beautiful. Uh, and that's a function of physics for the most part. Uh, the function required to let a sailboat sail uh, translates into a form of beauty because of the geometry required when you achieve the engineering effect that allows in modern sailboats a boat to pull itself through the uh, wind, if you will, uh, you end up with shapes that are, are really quite lovely. The hull designs have always been because of the hydraulic engineering required to, to let them move through. So if you're going to do a ship in a bottle, you might as well do one that's of a shape that you like. Uh, we're going to do a ship in a bottle today. Uh, and the shape I like, just other than Patty, of course, oh, just, just happens to be here. <laughs> That's Shamrock 5. It was a 1930s uh, America's Cup contender. Uh, it was more beautiful than successful, but beautiful. Uh, those of you who recall being in our house along the, the top of the bookcases where the fireplace is set in, in the living room, has several sailing ships, and one of them is the first America's Cup, which was a three-masted uh, ship, looked more like a cargo ship than, uh, than what we would think of as a racing sailing ship. And over the years, the designs have progressed to the point that, frankly, I no longer watch the America's Cup races. I used to stay up till three in the morning watching them not much happening. <laughs> But I don't anymore because they've become so sophisticated that they're, a lot of them are using wings that look like aircraft wings that stick up from hulls that uh, have hydrofoils. And, and for me, we've gotten to the point where the function is beyond what I appreciate 
as beautiful in any event. So I tend to go towards the, uh, the older boats. Well, you've picked your design. We've picked it. It's Shamrock 5. And, and now you got to get Shamrock 5 into some kind of form that you can stick in a bottle because the functionality is what produces the gracefulness or beauty of a sailboat, uh, usually you're going to do that by scaling it down, trying to keep something similar to the proportions of the boat you're, you're copying, or if you drew it, uh, something similar to the proportions that ended up on a piece of paper uh, that worked for you. And that's just arithmetic. Uh, You'll see here, perhaps, there you should have, uh, you can see they're kind of ugly. And all I was really doing was trying to get the measurements right that would preserve the proportion somewhere in the range. Uh, you see the thing that sticks up like a stick? Yes. That, uh, that was to get my proportions for the mast and where the sails would have to attach to end up with the effect. Uh, and you'd see most of it is just arithmetic annotations. I was going to need to have some kind of stand because otherwise the ship in a bottle rolls and that's usually not a good effect. Yeah. So the ship's in the bottle. Uh, the placement of the mast uh, fore to aft is always important. Uh, real world for it to sail properly. Uh, functional uh, appearance wise, that's a significant part of the proportions. So <clears throat> ugly and math. When you're, you're getting to things that are more important to you, uh, you're going to get a little more, you're going to care a little more about shape and design and make sure. And, and this was the way that I created, if you will, the, uh, the models for the sales. And I could make multiple copies of that and cut it up to my heart's content and cut sales using that as the pattern for the sales. So that's kind of the, some of the planning that goes into it, if you can call that planning. Mm -hmm. You have to have uh, materials to do it. You need wood. It's important. Uh, I like to use basswood. It's a, a medium density wood. It has a nice grain, uh, usually very straight. You don't have to worry about knots. Uh, comes in a block. You got to cut the block to produce thinner things, if you will. And uh, basically, what I needed to end up with was pieces for a stand and hulls. I'll explain why hulls. And um, a smaller piece of wood was a good one to use for the hulls. Then I use a band saw. You'll see it's pretty rough. And I want you to look at the width of it compared to the width that we end up with. If you can see the bottle here, there's no way that that's uh, going to go in that bottle. But I cut it broader on purpose because where you really get the shape of the hull is in the sanding process. Some folks like to put simulated water in a bottle. I'm not going to do anything more than to show you that. You can use uh, latex caulking and make a very thin uh, spread across a sheet of plastic or aluminum foil or something, uh, create the water effect and, and paint it to your heart's content. Personally, I, I reminded myself that I really like just the boat in the bottle. So I made one to show you. It's, a bit, it's the last you're going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> For tools, uh, let me get over here. When you cut things out on a bandsaw, be looking for shapes that will help you build it. Uh, there are a lot of things where you need to drill into things, through things, or you need them just to stay still. And uh, having a shape like that is very helpful to go along. Uh, you're going to need a, pins of various types. You need long sticks for various things. We'll talk about it. I find forceps very useful, uh, and we'll talk about that a little more. A pair of uh, tweezers with a bend to it is good. Sandpaper is essential. Use two kinds of glue. One is liquid stitch, which if you do sewing, you might be familiar with it. Uh, some people use it instead of sewing, and some folks use it in preparation for sewing. 
Uh, we'll talk more about the glue. We're going to use a clear uh, epoxy that hardens, they say, in a minute. It's usually more like a couple minutes. A pocket knife, wire cutters. We'll talk about that little drill in a bit. It's really helpful. Scissors, a pencil you need for sure, needle nose pliers. And, uh, and this little baby, you may recognize, those of you who sew, uh, one of my grandmothers taught me to sew because she said every man had to know how to sew when he wasn't with a woman. And uh, these little things that help you thread a needle, I'll show you, are to me darn near essential for building a boat in a bottle. So we took a block of wood. I, uh, I wanted to show you a picture of a bandsaw if you're not familiar with it. It's like an oversized jigsaw. Uh, more powerful, you can get larger pieces of wood through it, and it's useful for taking a block like that and cutting it down into the thinner shape, because you have a ripping fence, it's just a wall, you can slide it along. And I rough out the pieces for the hull, same tool, the bandsaw, and get the shape of the, the boat. In this case, I use the full width and length of the, the block I was starting with, again, basswood. You're going to need dowels of different sizes, and they will end up making masts and booms and all other sorts of things you need. I use uh, little pins to set up the rigging, and we'll talk about that. So you take it, you cut your rough shapes, and you're going to get into a lot of sanding going on because you want to take that shape in pr to produce a something more like a, a, a real hull. I don't think you can see that very well. Let me see if I can uh, give it to you better. I'm going to... Okay. So if you can see that, the hull is is now more or less like the actual hull of, of the sailing ship. And you get that by starting with the block. And I use, just because I find it easier to use, the same kind of sandpaper that you use for an orbital sander. It's thicker. I start with a really rough sandpaper, and I sand it like this rather than holding it and trying to rub the sandpaper. I can control it better. Uh, I can reduce it to what I need. And when you're doing the hull, you're constantly rolling the hull, uh, if you will, in almost every dimension except the deck dimension. And, and you're very gradually creating the hull shape. Uh, it's almost by feel. And it's, you know, you do a few strokes, you pick it up, you shape it. The hull has got to be symmetrical on both sides. So you're constantly changing as you go through from one side to another, bow to stern, keeping in mind the shape you actually want to end up with, and you achieve the whole shape through that sanding process. When I've got the rough shape, I use uh, 400 sandpaper, uh, and they, they make one that's frankly, they use a lot for body work on cars, prograde, precision, extra fine, 400 sandpaper, and that works real well on basswood and, and similar things. Okay, so you get a hull. And critical piece is you want to get to where the hull will eventually go in the bottle. So getting it narrow enough that it will go in the bottle, and you're going to have a bunch of rigging on top, I'll explain. So it's not just the hull. You have to be planning so that whatever you're going to have attached to that hull will also go in the box. So your ultimate size of the ship is going to be determined by what fits in the bottle, as well as the proportion work that you did to, uh, to get it to what you want it to be like. OK. Um, when you have a, a sailboat, Um, it has sails and masts, and uh, as you can see, ain't no way that's going in the bottle. 
So the critical element in terms of your planning and starting is figuring out how you're going to get it in the bottle. Uh, there are people who are really, really, really skilled who can actually do a lot of the building in the bottle with uh, long forceps and that sort of thing. It would never happen with me. I don't know anybody who was able to do that. A lot of people do some finishing once it's in the bottle. Uh, for most people, getting a ship in a bottle in a bottle is a matter of creating a hinge for the mast. Because once it's in the bottle, you have to be able to pull on your rigging extensions to raise the mast inside the bottle. And you can only do that if you've created a hinge where the mast comes to the ship. And you, you'd prefer that it not be. Now, I got to tell you at this point, uh, I, I like having a practice boat <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Uh, especially if it's been 40 years since you've done it. It's good because you're going to make a lot of mistakes remembering, but even more importantly than that, uh, you got to try different things out and you don't want to waste a lot of time doing decent fine work while you're figuring out the mechanics. Let me do it this way. Okay, so you can see that boat. And if you look at the bottom where the mast joins the hull, you can see some dark wire at the bottom. That's my hinge as I was figuring out the mechanics of it. You'll note the work on the sails and the mast and that kind of thing is really rough. The, uh, the masts have not been tapered. That's a critical part of it, looking like a real sailboat. But when you're just figuring out the mechanics, you, you want to get everything the same size, but you don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, like doing things like tapering the masts and spars. So let me show you the, the hinge solution that I use. And I take my hull. I've figured out the proportions, done the measurements, figured out where the mast has got to be on the hull. And I've marked it with a little mark on either side of the mast because this is a practice hull. It can be an ugly mark. Then these little drills are just, uh, just wonderful. They're twist drills. You can get a drill in about 30 bits for, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 bucks at Amazon and all kinds of different ones. But if you do any kind of small work that requires holes, I really recommend them. You, you put the point down, the top part here spins, so you can push down with your part of your palm and twist the drill with your fingers like that. And, uh, and the bits cut very quickly. When you're using them, to do something like this, the bits are really, really small, fine, and tend to break. Uh, so one thing I recommend to you is adjust the bit to be only slightly longer than what you're drilling through. Because the shorter you can make the bit, the better your chances are you're going to get the holes done without it breaking. So we, uh, we mark this puppy. We drill through it. And remember I said, save a piece or two that'll be nice for holding things. So you put it down and you just twist. And you apply enough pressure to get through without breaking your bit. Keep twisting and pull it out. Do your other hole. Get it out. Now you've got holes that go all the way through your sailboat. see the holes they come out the other side now you're going to put wire through there so you're going to need to make some provision for after you've finished there's going to be wire on this side you're going to need to park it someplace so it's not very visible and so it's not in the way if you will uh, you can either countersink a hole take a bigger bit and just drill 
So like a slight depression in the bottom that after you're done twisting wire, you can put it in the depression. Uh, if it's very fine wire, you can put a little slit that the twisted wire will end up in. Speaking of wire, you saw on the practice boat, I used uh, some of Patty's uh, flower arranging wire. Uh, it was easier to handle, worked just fine. Let me see if the mechanics would work, not what you want on the finished product. So having rated Patty's materials once, I thought I'd do it again. And uh, she had some very fine brass wire, which was just what I needed. Uh, I tend to use brass fittings for almost everything. And uh, I have here a sort of an excuse for a mast. And you'll note maybe in the end there, I've drilled a small hole through. Uh, where that hole is is important because that's where the, the wire is going to go through to hole it. I'm going to be doing other holes in that mast for the rigging, uh, but the first and you want to get all the holes drilled before you attach the mast because it's really awkward trying to drill holes when you got a boat dangling off of what you're trying to drill. So to, to make the hinge, you get the uh, copper wire coming up through the hole from the bottom. I'll show you this in a moment. And then you put it through the hole in the mast. Maybe. Ah. I remember now I started that, but left it so I could demonstrate this wonderful drilling process. So we're drilling the hole through the mast. Uh, you want to have a fair amount of dowel on hand because if you're like me, you're going to break a bunch of things. <laughs> when you start putting little holes through little pieces of wood and then you put any pressure on them at all, uh, it's not uncommon to be making the same piece more than once. So wires up through the hull. Putting the wire through the hole in the mast, maybe. And then I'm going to take the wire and go back down through the other hole. Let me show you what this looks like. Okay, you can see it's come up one side. It's about to go down the other side on the other side of the mast. That hinge is going to get a fair amount of pressure applied to it while you're building the ship and when you're trying to raise it inside the bottle. So you want to use a decent wire that can take some uh, twisting and abuse. Once you get both wires through the other side, grab them with a needle nose plier and twist it a few times. You want to get it tight enough that the mast will stand on its own, but loose enough that the mast will fold down. And, and some of that is just doing it a few times, which helps shape the mend of the mast against the hull it's going to be rotating on. And uh, you'll get it right. Make sure you've got multiple twists on the bottom side so it doesn't come undone in the bottle or at some other critical stage. When you get it, then clip it. Leave a number of those twists there so it doesn't come undone. And then if you've done the depression in the bottom or the split, the slit with a knife point, you just fold it back down into the depression or into the slit, and it's out of the way and will not be noticeable. So there you go, a rough hull with a rough pass. <laughs> now, the boom is the part that holds the bottom of the sail, and uh, it's going to have to come out from the mast like so. This is 
This is more boom-like. So you're going to do exactly the same thing we did to put the mast in. For that, you're going to figure out where it needs to be, which is going to be pretty close to the hull since you're simulating a large ship. Uh, a man stands under the boom, usually. Not always. Sometimes I get hit by the boom. But so in this case, the man would be about, I don't know, a sixth of a sixteenth of an inch tall. So the boom is not going to be very far off of the deck of the boat. Same process. You hinge it, uh, you bring it around, and, and you fold it down, or you double wrap it back and twist it so the hinge left over gets lost in where the boom and the mast join together. Uh, now, that gets you your critical pieces for the boat, critical in the wood department anyway. The strength of a real sailboat and the strength of a model sailboat comes from the rigging. Uh, John could tell you that if you lose a forestay, uh, your mast falls down. I don't care how strong the mast is, it cannot stand up, it cannot resist the pressures of the wind unless it has uh, stays holding it up. And that's where the real strength of a sailboat is. Uh, if you've ever read stories about sea battles with sailing ships, uh, they were always aiming their cannon at the masts because if they could crack a mast, uh, it was gonna come down and it's the multiple effect of lines that hold it up. So if you, can, uh, if you can get the mast starting to come and one of those stays or pieces of rigging snapping, pretty soon they're all gonna go because it's the collective effect of all of the pieces that give it its strength. So in the real world, you gotta have, you gotta have stays that hold it up. The ones that go from the top of the mast to the stern of the boat uh, is an aft stay, you have a fore stay, and then you have to have them that hold up the mast side to side. Those are called shrouds. And you can see on that boat coming down on either side of the mast is a shroud that goes to the deck. This is tricky. See where it comes down to the deck? And just like on a real sailboat, those are what hold the thing together. But since we're trying to stick this thing in a bottle, you can't rig it like you would a real boat. You'd be having your shrouds angled back and forth. You can if you want to increase the complexity a great deal of doing this. Uh, but if you have them more or less aligned with the mast, then it'll be able to fold with those shrouds on the side. So I, I haven't loosened the shrouds, the sidelines at all. Uh, the stay, the fore stay, is the one which slackens. And the, the stay running to the stern of the boat is measured and tied off because it's just going to go slack when you fold the sailboat. So that's what you're trying to get to. That's how the boat's going to stand up and uh, withstand of some abuse in the bottle, you need to do sails. And uh, if you're like me, you say to the lady of your house, hey, Patty, could I have one of your old slips? Please note, complete with a pretty little uh, lace at the bottom. Uh, Daycron is being used for sails these days, and Daycron or nylon or whatever works well. It needs to be fairly soft, fairly thin, uh, and sails are cut on a bias in the real world. So you're in the sail, the grain of the sail is running diagonally towards where the boom and the mast connect. That makes them stronger. If you, you care about your boat looking right as a model, uh, you want to do that too, because somebody like John will critique you and say, you didn't get that right. I, I didn't say, please feel free to uh, ask any questions, make any comments, and certainly uh, respond to any uh, good-natured insults I throw out. But, uh, I don't like know how you got into this in the first place. This is such a minuscule 
a small motor skill kind of thing that's like, holy cow. Well, you know, 40 some years ago, I was a more minuscule motor skill kind of person. <laughs> Uh, I got into it because I enjoyed sailing, and uh, I would spend a lot of time uh, on camp staffs, uh, scout camps where I could sail, and I'd have a lot of time on my hands in the in scout camp. And uh, and the first one started off with just a pocket knife, and whatever I could scrounge. And uh, I think my first ship in a bottle was uh, I got a quart size bottle of vanilla extract from the the camp chef. I learned later he was an alcoholic and had so much vanilla extract because he ordered enough for the season so he could drink it by the court all through the season. But gave me a lot of bottles to put chips in anyway. Yeah, I'd have to do it in a mason jar. <laughs> <laughs> well, we made Wide it. mouth mason jar, yeah. As we put in the advertising for this, you never know until the last moment whether it's gonna work. And we won't know today whether it's going to work. Okay. So sales. Uh, you cut the sales. I showed you kind of the patterns that I worked out to, to keep the proportions of Shamrock 5 sales there behind me. And and I, I just put the designs uh, underneath. The cloth is, is thin enough. And I told you I made copies so I could actually just hold the two together and cut it. Now, when you're using fine cloth like that, it can unravel very easily. And so a way you avoid that, I don't know anybody else in the world who does this, so I'm giving you one of my uh, patented uh, techniques here. I take liquid stitch, make a line of it, kind of like a line of cocaine, they tell me, or at least the guys I prosecuted used to. And I lay the edge of the sail near that line of liquid stitch. And I dab my finger and I dab the edge of the sail with it. In this case, you know, like a 16th, maybe an 18th of an inch into the edge of the sail. Smooth it out. The liquid stitch is made for cloth. And so when it dries, it's virtually invisible. Pull it up. I do that to all of them. And then when it's dried in an hour or so, you can go and trim the sail again. You'll get a straight edge. You'll get rid of any threads that were starting to pull. And it'll give you a more body to be able to put your uh, stitching you're going to have to do through when you get around to attaching the sail. So do that to all the edges of the sails. Now, when you got it, you got to attach it on the practice boat. I just wanted to make sure the mechanics were going to work. And so you see the, the stitching that goes around on a real sail. Uh, you're either going to have lines that run up inside the sail and or inside the mast, or you're going to have hoops, often uh, brass hoops, that slide up the mast, if you will. Uh, combining those two things, let me see if I can get the knot practice boat. You'll see when I went to attach them, when I was trying to simulate the hoops, you can see they're much closer together, uh, more regular, and they look a little bit more like hoops than uh, the rough running stitch. So I take a little bit of glue. I, I still use that liquid stitch stuff, and I'll run a very thin line along the edge of the wood part, the boom or the mast. Uh, and I'll attach the sail very lightly to that because that's not really what's going to hold it on. And I'll do that to both sides, if you will. And then very carefully and frustratingly, I'm going to sew that sail to the mass just going around from one side to the other. Now, because you've already got rigging on your boat when you're doing this, if you're like me, you'll at least four or five times manage to stitch your shrouds or your stays to your mast, <laughs> which means you go back and start over again, at least back to the point at which you have your shroud sewed onto your mast, because that's not going to work real well. 
you got to do all everything attaching of your shrouds and your stays to the boat. Uh, you can sometimes just drill holes through the boat and, and run the line through the hole. Uh, I prefer to use little little brass fittings. You can see a round one sticking up at the top on the deck of the stern and another little loop on there. A flat fitting there that holds the shroud and more fittings on the bow. You can, uh, what I do is I, if you go to Amazon or any place that sells jewelry making material, they sell these pins they use for making jewelry with round tops and flat tops and uh, I just get those and then I cut them down to what I need. If they're going to go into the hull of the boat or any other wooden part, I, I drill, start the hole with the drill, not all the way. I put a little bit of glue on the pin itself and then put it in and then I don't hammer, I force in. Again, using a block or something like that, usually push down on the hull to push the pin in. Uh, and, and that's how, don't forget the glue because they will over time kind of wobble and come out if you, if you do that. Okay. I wanted to show you, I talked to you about the, uh, the wonderful little sewing device my grandmother would not let me use. Uh, you know how to thread a needle with one of these. You poke a little wire through the, uh, through the needle, it has a larger hoop when it comes out, and you put the thread through and you pull the thread back through. These are wonderful for attaching rigging to masts because you're gonna drill a bunch of holes in your mast at the attachment points, and you take that, you put it through the hole in your mast, and you pull your piece of rigging back through the hole. One little rule of thumb whenever you're doing anything, whether it's wire or thread or anything else, do not be stingy. You know, if, if you think you need four inches, use a foot. Like you can always cut it off, but if you have extra thread or extra wire in the process, it's much easier to form the knots or do whatever you have to do. Uh, and then you draw it down and get the knot tight and then trim the stuff down. Okay, so for the, the foresails, we needed to attach the, the rigging for the sails to the mast in three different places to get the shamrock shape. And because the boat's mast is going to fold back, every one of those has to be loose. And so you do it, attach it with a little loop that'll let the thread run through it, and you let a couple feet of thread come out. That's what you're going to pull once it's in the bottle to get it back up again. So, so as you're doing it, you start off with it loose, and then you pull it tight. You got to hold it tight while you're attaching the sails, and you can't knot it or glue it. This is where forceps come in really handy. They're great for all kinds of things. Uh, if you are of the medical profession, you'll be familiar with their quality of being able to clip and lock. And, and so it works like a hand clamp. So I can pull those threads out, put that on it. It'll keep it from running back through and hold those tight while I am uh, attaching the sails to the forward lines. You get it tight like that. You take your sails, you attach the sails to the rigging the same way you did on the mast. I take a little bit of glue with a stick, dab it in a puddle of the glue and run a line of glue along the, the rigging line in the place that I want it. The placement of the sails is really important because they are the, the dramatic part of the appearance of the boat. A little bit of glue, you get it just attached 
with the glue. It's, you can't rely on that because as it goes up and down and whatnot, they're probably going to come loose. So what you do, once you have them attached, is you take a piece of thread, you go through your rigging, pull it up. This is where the extra is really helpful. And you just do an overhand stick, overhand knot, and you very carefully draw it down, getting smaller and smaller until you're just about where you want it to be to hold the sail to the line. You see there, I'm almost there. You just keep pulling that knot until it ends up. I'm not going to pull this one because this is already tied on there and get it really tight and put a second overhand stitch on it. You just need one of those at the top and bottom edge of the sail onto the, onto the line. And that will uh, keep the sail there, we hope. Uh, when you have overlapping sails like this, you can take another little dab of liquid stitch, put it under the underside of the point, and touch it to the other sail to get the overlap effect you can see on shamrock. And uh, that'll hold it in place while you're fiddling around with the thing. OK. I think that gets you to a boat. Is there something I haven't covered that you would uh, you would like to know about in terms of getting one of these put together and hopefully at the point of getting it in a bottle? OK. Now, this is the practice boat. You see you crunch it down. You're going to have to kind of wiggle the mast and the boom enough to get it flat. Flat enough, it will go in the bottle. And you're going to push it back with the bow coming out of the bottle. Okay, we're getting close to the moment of truth here. <laughs> so you fold it. Your lines are going to have to come out smoothly and run. So you want to fold it. Hopefully nothing is getting tangled. No sails are getting messed up. And you're trying to avoid creases in the sails if you can. So you'll point it at the bottle, my dear. Make sure I've got the right bottle. By the way, uh, for those of you who enjoy single malt scotch, Dalwini bottles, I happen to like the scotch. So uh, and I save all Dalwini bottles. So you'll keep that there. So I'm going to push that in. So far, it's fitting. OK, for better or for worse, it's in the bottle. Now, we mentioned you got to have a stand where your bottle is just going to roll around. So. Made the stand. I finished the wood, by the way, with one of two things. That once it's sanded and ready to go, I finish it with either Danish oil. Watco makes it. Uh, usually, I use a neutral color. It does come with tints. I uh, also use tongue oil, uh, which is what Chinese have finished furniture with for hundreds of years. Um, and this is just a the dowel running through the two pieces I cut to the shape that I needed. The dowel holds the two pieces up. OK, so that now, and you're going to have to do the moving because okay. I just got to do what I just got to do what guys got to do here. I've got little pads on these forceps to try and keep from messing up the hull in this process. You see the sailboat is up? Yeah.
the problem with the the glue that I use, the epoxy, very quick epoxy, is that you can't mix it ahead of time because it will just become a hard puddle. So we're going to mix it now. This stuff is kind of funny. I, John may know, I don't, but I think it relies upon a chemical crystallizing effect. Because although it says it's a minute, and maybe two minutes before it sets, in truth, it won't set, it won't set, and then instantly it sets hard. And I think that's. Yeah, I've never seen one that sets as fast as they say it will. No. But they do, they, they're workable, and then all of a sudden they're not. Right. I would suggest that if you used a mason jar, this would all be a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Good, John. <laughs> but look, it's pretty. <laughs> Wouldn't have the mystique anymore. Yeah. Okay, now I'm just going to hold that and hope that it's going to set and uh, has got the lines. If it doesn't, I'm going to have to go back and do the lines again. I'm just putting a little daub of glue on the brass fitting where the, the lines run through on the bow. Mm. So we're waiting for that magic moment when the, the stuff sets and hopefully it's going to hold the line. So while I'm, I'm sitting here and Patty is uh, being technical advisor, do you have any questions or anything you'd like to talk about? Nice weather, a little cold? So I assume, uh, I assume, Kip, this is Cheryl, that you are going to show us how you actually fix it in the bottle so it doesn't move around. Yeah, uh, you actually have two choices. You can leave it. I, I may or may not be able to, Cheryl, depending on time and glue. But what you do is you, you take the uh, one of these long sticks and mm -hmm. put a glob of epoxy on the end of the stick and you lift the boat into the you know sort of above where you're going to put that daub of epoxy mm -hmm. uh, and then you let it down uh, what i have done and i don't think will work for this boat is if you can take blue tack and put it on the end of a long stick and use that to lift the boat while you take a second stick to put the daub of epoxy on the bottom, which is going to be under the boat when you let the boat down onto the epoxy. Okay. I assume in the olden days they used hide glue or something else of. Uh, I'm sure they uh, did. Didn't get all that fast. You know, kind of like Boy Scout camp, whatever they could get. <laughs> Uh, I expect not a few galleys were raided. Maybe even pine pitch of some sort. Woodwork, yep. And a lot of that on an old sailboat. Mm-hmm. Boy, the suspense is killing you. It's killing me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we toured the Delhenny, uh, Delwini, uh, Delwini, uh, uh, brewery, yeah, distillery. <laughs> distillery. Distillery. It was a good, it was a good trip because uh, Cindy and Rachel didn't drink there, so I got to drink. Oh, uh, wonderful, wonderful! Isn't that great? Yeah. Okay, the glue did not hold it. Oh no! Uh -oh. We didn't no. pray hard enough. I, I think that was the problem. <laughs> it's all our fault. Well, it's going to take a, 
Maybe it hadn't. This delicate work must have been difficult to do on a moving ship. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. They might have done this part when they got in port. Yeah, that would make sense. There we go. I think it's just heading set. Yeah, because they're okay. Out. Any questions? Amazing. Yeah, no, that was that was really quite the process. But uh, it takes a lot of patience. Yeah. You know, I, there's nobody uh, else I would have done it for but Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> is this is this the one you're going to give to your grandchild? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. That looks good. Uh, some of these other hulls in progress will uh, we're going to go in uh, order of age. Down. Oh, okay. All right. I think yeah. ten years old is going to become the magic age. Well, that's a. I will say. That's a great custom. I will say. You know, that's an excellent excuse to drink Dalwini. Hey, you got to do what you got to do. 